Hello, and welcome to the Zicklin Talks Business Series. I'm Akita Davis Friday, Interim Dean of the Zicklin School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Facial Recognition Technology for Good or for Evil. Joining me is Gwen Webb, Associate Dean for Executive Programs, who will moderate the question and answer period. Our guest today is Yafid Labaretz, Assistant Professor in the Zicklin School's Department of Law. And leading the conversation is Larry Zicklin, retired chairman of Norberger Berman, an alumnus, our benefactor, and instructor in our programs. Larry, you take it away. Thank you, Kikita. Um, Yafid, I want to begin by asking you, how did you in your personal journey, get into tech policy as a specialty? Um, that's a great question. Um, so it started actually very early on. I didn't want to be a lawyer, to be honest. Uh, my father uh, really wanted me to go to law school and I really just wanted to study literature. And um, he secretly signed me, in, signed me up or I mean, sent my application to law school. And when I was uh, admitted, he told me, why don't you go for a year, see if you like it. And if not, we can continue. Um, you can go you know, to whatever other school you're interested in. So I agreed, you know, because you don't say no to your dad. And I went and I did the first year. And actually in the first class, I realized that I love it, that you know, the law has everything and it's fascinating. And then, I really wanted to be a defense lawyer. I was really into criminal law. I felt like, you know, this is how we maintain the integrity of the system, but by, ha by having good people um, practicing uh, defense lawyering. And this is what I wanted to do. And then my mentor, when I was on my third year of law school, he committed suicide because of his job. Um, he was um, the deputy of the, of the Israeli uh, defense lawyer, um, like public defense lawyer. And um, at that point, I was really puzzled. I didn't know what to do. I realized that this is not my thing. I'm not going to kind of ruin my life because of, because of my job. And I was looking for something that did not involve human beings. And this is how I got to technology. I realized this is what I'm interested in. I'm just going to do technology, you know, technology policy. And I started with intellectual property and then I ventured into FinTech and then I did some other um, areas. And um, you know, it was very early on that I realized that there is no place with no humans and of all places, technology has humans more than anything, right? It affects humans, um, it, humans build it. So this is how I got to technology policy. And I'm really, really interested specifically not in tech law, but in tech policy, and I want to take a second just to explain what it means, because, you know, tech law, it's all the laws that involve technology, and there are many of them. Tech policy, it's not just about the law, it's about this constant race between technology and the law. And during this race, you have, you have many periods of kind of vacuum, you don't have any law to address a new technology. And this is where tech policy steps in. It you know, informs the conversation with lessons from other areas, with ethical considerations, with even reputational considerations for businesses. And this is what I do. I kind of look you know, from a broader perspective on different technologies and take part in this policy conversation. So, so now let me narrow it to facial recognition. Um, is facial recognition what we all understand it to be? Or there are, are there nuances of facial recognition that we should be aware of? That's a great question. So let me start with kind of the oversimplifying way we think about facial recognition, okay? So it works by capturing an image or a video of a person's face, and then it compares it to a database of known faces to find a match. So that's kind of the very simple explanation. But if we want to think about it in a more sophisticated way, facial recognition works by creating a map of your face. So the map contains your own unique features and measurements, the distance between, let's say, your forehead and your chin or between your eyes. And there are two main types of facial recognition technology. We have 2D and we have 3D. And without getting into too much tech, you know, tech details, 2D analyzes kind of a two-dimensional image of the face of the face and uh, 3D analyzes with you know depth sensing cameras to create the three-dimensional model of a face. 
And then you take whatever outcome you get and you make it into code and it is called biometric token or a face print. So this is how it works. And both, I think both ways of thinking about facial recognition is, is okay for the purposes of our discussion, but just to give you a little more sophistication for the definition. And may I just, you said, you mentioned biometric token. So could you just give us an um, example of the other types of biometrics that are used to recognize? Sure, fingerprint, okay. Um, there are voice recognitions. It's also biometric. So anything that uses your physical features is considered biometrics. Mm -hmm. And there are different definitions and different laws. And we can talk about some laws that um, deal with biometrics. Uh, no federal laws and at this point, just state laws. But there are different definitions. But most of them look at the all of the physical features that we have. Uh, some of them are broader that look into, for example, emotions. So if you analyze my emotion, some laws would consider that to be biometric information as well. Um, but others just consider the kind of raw facial features, physical features of a self. And, and does the universe require thousands, if not billions of faces to be imaged before we can really make this thing work because we can see the differences among them? Um, the answer is yes. I mean, the bigger the um, training data set is, is generally in technology, it's considered to be a better product because it's trained on more data. That's true for any kind of technology you have in mind, including chat GPT and other AI technologies. So yes, in order to have a working technology, including facial recognition, you would have to have a really robust database with many, many faces that have been scanned and analyzed by the system. And I, I mean, admittedly, at the early days of facial recognition, the technology was not as good as it is, as, as it is today, even though today as well, we see errors, but it's still significantly better than it used to be. Given that understanding, who are the most frequent users of facial recognition and for what purpose? <sighs> Okay, so I think it, the best way to think about it is to divide it between public and private. So when you think about the private sector, we have many uses, commercial uses, ranging from retail to when you unlock your phone, you have facial recognition. When you um, take a flight, I, I know Delta is using facial recognition and United. Um, so there are many, many uses when you go to Madison Square Garden, for example, they'll scan your face when you, um, um, sometimes when you take, I mean, trains are usually public, but many uses of facial recognition to most of the time make your, make your life easier as a user. So when you unlock your phone, the fact that you don't have to, you know, punch in a number um, and you can just put it in front of your face that's convenience. So those are the commercial uses. There are many, many, of course, I just gave it some examples. Um, there are also commercial uses when it comes to employment, which we think about as private, but it's borderline public because there are more laws regulating this use. Um, and of course, in the public sector, we look at it when it comes to um, law enforcement, mostly. Um, foreign intelligence, and when uh, transportation, which I mentioned before, so subway stations in New, York, in New York City, for example, have facial recognition systems, and uh, education. So even public systems of education use facial recognition systems. So you're, you're telling me every time I walk into the subway, there are cameras measuring my face and storing them somewhere? Yes. And when I go into a retail establishment, if it has a camera, is it storing it somewhere or is it downloading it to some central location? So when it comes to retail, specifically in New York City, it's kind of a unique situation because, I mean, in the, quest the answer to this question depends on the location. But specifically, if we talk about New York City, uh, Eric Adams, actually, the mayor actually encouraged retailers to use facial recognition technologies to fight shoplifting. Um, but according to a New York City law, they have to have a disclosure 
of the fact that they're using this technology. So if you guys had the opportunity to walk into a retail store and see um, uh, some kind of disclosure saying that we're using biometric, we're, we're collecting biometric information or smile your own camera. Sometimes it, it's very short, but it has to be more detailed. Um, so most of the time they will use the system not to store information about you, but just to compare your face to a list of faces on kind of a watch list, people who already um, were um, identified as shoplifters. So uh, if you guys go to Fair Fairway, for example, they do use facial recognition technologies to fight shoplifting. So for example, when you walk into the store, I think last time I was there, I saw it on the, on the sliding door, um, just taped there. It's not something permanent. Um, and when you walk in, you'll see that there, there are cameras around. And if if you are identified as someone who shoplifted before or who are on some kind of a blacklist for shoplifters, because they sometimes share this information among retailers, you will be asked to leave or be approached by a security guard. Can can my can the facial recognition be used um, to use my face commercially in some way? The answer is again, it depends. So I'm gonna step, take a step back, Larry, and just explain that there is no federal law at this point that regulates the use of facial recognition. And I'll let this sink in for a second. No federal law. So yes, okay. just, and, and then back, so the technology itself, but then what about the storage of the images? That's also true about the storage of the images. Yes, yes. So there is nothing that no, regulation at the moment at the federal level that addresses facial recognition, including the use of the technology or the retention of the information. But states took matters into their own hands, as we see generally in the context of privacy in recent years. So the first state that enacted biometric um, laws or privacy, information privacy uh, biometric law is Illinois. And they have a law from 2008. And it's funny because it's long before we started having these conversations about facial recognition, but they have a law called the Illinois Biometrics Information Privacy Act. We call it in short BIPA, B-I-P-A. And it's the first state that, as I said, enacted the law. And the law requires that the use of biometric information, including facial recognition, has to be first disclosed and uh, the data subject has to agree. But what's interesting about this law and the reason why it's considered the most you know, strict law out there when it comes to facial recognition or biometrics uh, more broadly is that not only it requires consent, it also does not allow the sale of biometric information, which is very interesting. It doesn't allow any commercial entity to commodify our faces or any biometric information about us. So that's a huge thing. Another thing that uh, BIPA does is it allows for a private right of action, which is for those of you who are involved in, in privacy, you know that this is one of the, of the biggest contentions when it comes to privacy uh, legislation. A private right of action means that an individual, if, you, if there was a violation of the law, you can, as an individual, sue, as opposed to having the attorney general sue. Um, so under BIPA, you can sue as an individual. So if someone collected your biometric information without your consent, or if someone sold it, or going to your question, Paquita, about retention, if the information was kept for longer than the law allows, and the law says that the information can be retained only for I believe a certain period of time after the purpose for which it was collected was fulfilled. And if the law was violated, any individual can go and sue the company. And the way damages are calculated is per violation. And when it comes to facial recognition, like usually it's more than one violation, you know, because you have multiple pictures or you have multiple identifications. So the numbers are really like, when there are lawsuits under BIPA, the numbers are really high. Um, there are other states that also have laws for, um, it's not, again, not specifically for facial recognition, but biometrics more broadly, like Texas and Washington, but their laws are not as strong as the Illinois law. Now, keep in mind that sometimes when companies act in the virtual space, 
they don't know, or even in the physical space, they don't know if the person um, whose face they just scanned is an Illinois resident or not. And this is why many companies try to adhere to the same kind of high standard that Illinois law uh, provide. But it's not, unfortunately, it's not true across the board. But I'm just going to mention one lawsuit under the Illinois law, which was um, in 2019 against Facebook, was decided in 2019, it was filed long before, um, and it had to do with facial recognition. So those of you who listen to me right now, if you were on Facebook in the early days of the social network, like I did, if you guys remember, sometimes you will see one, photos of you that were tagged without your consent or without you actively tagging yourself, like a friend would upload a photo of you and suddenly you'll see on your feed that you were tagged in a photo. Um, so that uses facial recognition technology. And people were really upset about that because like, okay, I went to a party last night. I don't want the whole world to know that. So you took a picture of me, but don't tag me, like don't put my face out there. And there was a lawsuit against Facebook based on the Illinois Act. And they had to pay, I believe, 600 uh, and fifty million dollars in the settlement of this um, of this case, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, that's a lot of money. And there is another one um, against TikTok, which is more recent, but that's not specifically just about facial recognition. It's about generally the collection of. I mean, TikTok collects a lot. Just so you guys all know, I have TikTok on my phone. I'm not trying to judge anyone, but just so you know, like facial recognition. Um, the way you click different videos, uh, the way you tap if you browse on TikTok. So it collects a lot of information and they were sued for various privacy violations and were also, uh, they agreed to pay, I believe it was $92 million um, in the settlement. So we see different laws, different state laws out there. Um, and we see some litigation because there is this private cause of action, private right, of, private right of action that individuals can sue. Um, but for example, under the Texas law, individuals cannot sue. It's only the attorney general. So that gives a whole different level of deterrence when it comes to facial recognition and the use so of you, facial recognition. So you, think, you mentioned New York City has a law. Is it typical for cities to have their own laws as opposed to state law? I mean, some municipalities have laws when it comes to facial recognition. Um, and again, it comes from general frustration around privacy violations. So there are so there is so much going on with privacy. And you know, since 2018, I think the general public knows what we privacy scholars knew way before, which is information is collected, it's used, it's been commodified. Uh, not only we don't get anything out of it, we are exposed and, you know, information about us is being exposed to different uses that could harm us later uh, down the line. And in 2018, when most people started understanding that after the Cambridge Analytica story, we started seeing more and more kind of legal activity on the federal level, but none came to fruition. The last one was the ADPPA, the, Ameri the American Data and Privacy Protection Act. Um, and th this last one, we were all very hopeful about, but even that one did not uh, make it to the finish line. So nothing happens on the federal level. You read so many stories about what's happening and you want to do something. So states starting, started enacting some privacy laws. Uh, we have five states at this point that have omnibus privacy laws, comprehensive privacy laws. Um, and cities were also frustrated with, with this kind of delay that they also started doing their own thing. When it comes to facial recognition, specifically um, San Francisco had a law, New York, New York City had a law, um, and other cities, yeah. And again, it's just this frustration that we see all this information being collected in a wild, wild west environment and being really fearful about that because unlike other types of information, so let's say your social security number um, is now exposed, okay? Someone collected this information about you and now there was a hack, this information is out there. You can change your social security number. You cannot change your facial features. You cannot change your biometrics. This is who you are. Once this information is out there and misused, that's the end of it. Well, wait a second. My facial recognition at 40 doesn't look like it is at 80. Does that... <laughs> Completely. Believe it or not, it does. I mean, it doesn't. I, I agree with what you're saying, but it's very easy to um, identify you at 80 through a photo of you at 40. 
I know it sounds, uh, it doesn't make sense, but I can tell you for those of you who use, for example, Google Drive for your photos or even Apple, um, you can see that they make those little videos. Did you guys have the chance of seeing them on your phone? Like, you know, your last trip to, I don't know, whatever. I, I have a two-year-old, I have a nine-year-old and I have a 12-year-old. And at some point, Google made, Google Photos made a video and it called it, it titled it, They Grow So Fast. And it just showed me a video of all of their pictures, not all of them, but like sample pictures from the day they were born to this day. So I'm talking about from the day my daughter was born to this day, she's 12. Google was able to draw this line just by having the pictures. And, and, and they did this with or without your permission? In that case, it was with my permission because whenever you use a photo, um, a photo service, Google, Apple, whatever it is, Amazon, you have to give consent. Is facial recognition reliable enough now to be accepted as proof in a courtroom? No. <clears throat> No, it's not. And it was just last month that someone was misidentified. And unfortunately, um, facial recognition is not only prone to errors, it's also still biased because we talked about the fact that it's trained on a data set of pictures. And this data set, unfortunately, is not representative of different populations. And as a result, it has the higher error rates when it comes to Black women. So Black men as well, but Black women is the most vulnerable population when it comes to facial recognition. And specifically last month, there was a, a person who was misidentified, a Black man in Maryland who was misidentified in a shoplifting case. Um, I mean, the, the police just knocked on their door and took him just based on this identification from a facial recognition software, which ended up being wrong. And this is why in different parts of the country now, there are um, different states pass moratorium on the use of facial recognition software as the sole reason for arrest um, or for, I, I, unless you have more information that supports the fact that this person was indeed in the said, um, or in proximity to the said venue, you cannot arrest them based on facial, just on facial recognition. So you can use this as corroborating evidence. Yes. At this point in some states, yes. So your feet to the bias, you mentioned part of the issue is that the databases don't have enough of the representation um, of certain groups, but it's a little bit of a catch-22. So some people are probably reluctant to have the images stored. And so that's going to continue to cause this um, lack of information or lack of representation in the databases, right? Yes, yes, that's absolutely true. And more than that, I can tell you that there are different groups, especially young people. I'm really, I'm really surprised and happy to see how they are active when it comes to facial recognition. So there are different, uh, different clothing that you can buy that the selling point for those lines of clothing is that they will, um, they will mislead facial recognition systems. So for example, you can wear a hat that's that, that's gonna have some kind of print on it and it's going to confuse the system. Makeup, there are makeup lines, complete makeup lines that people can buy that can confuse facial recognition systems. So unfortunately, this is where my technical expertise stops. I really don't know how it works and what the details are, but I do know it's really a thing and many people actively try to deceive facial recognition um, systems. Do you have any idea why Black women are particularly prone to facial recognition error? Yeah, I mean, it's it's sad, but the reason is just, you know, historically, um, Black people have less representation in databases of all sorts, not just facial. Um, and women generally have less representation in databases of all sorts. So when you put Black and women, they are kind of the most vulnerable um, part of the population for being misidentified. And because they have been traditionally um, lacking representation in those databases. And, and given what I read about the police in many cities, they seem to be uh, scrupulously... Uh, um, I don't know, observe more frequently, and they probably make that error also, but that's a different story. Let, yeah. me, let me go go to January 6th. Yeah. 
from what I read, a number of the people on Jan January 6th um, were arrested based on facial recognition. How does that corroborate with your statement? So again, many police staff, many police departments all over the country use facial recognition systems. Now, when I say facial recognition systems, some of them have authority structure that requires more checks before you can use the system. Some of them ask for more checks before you can use the output of the system. Uh, but I, I think it's fair to say that the majority of police departments across the country use facial recognition. And in terms of um, what software they're using, it varies significantly, but I wanna tell you specifically about one company that's called Clearview AI. So Clearview AI, what the, the, the product that they were selling, still selling, um, is basically an app. Think about an app on your phone. You're a police officer now. You just take your phone, you put it in front of a person, uh, snap a picture of them or even a video of them live. And within seconds, the app gives you a full profile about that person. So what the app would do is pull up their faces from various sources, including above all um, social networks and using this information, just building whatever you know, extracting the name and then finding whatever they can find about this person online. Now, I mean, this technology dates back to, I want to say 2015. It's not new, but what Clearview AI did was to package it so effectively and so seamlessly. And now you just have this really cool app that you can use. And many police departments bought this uh, technology and then uh, there was a story in the New York I, Times. I want to stop you there for one second. All right. Yeah. So a policeman stops me in a car because I passed a stop sign and takes my picture in some way, either using his body camera or a camera. And within a few seconds, he knows all about me. So, yeah, again, let's explain the in terms of the technology, the answer is yes. It's definitely um, a possibility the technology is there. But what happens is that after the story broke, there was a lot of public backlash. People did not like it. People felt like it was wrong for many reasons that we mentioned already, including error and bias. Like you cannot use this information uh, in the context, in a context so sensitive like law enforcement and you know, such a daily use without accounting for the fact that there are significant error rates when it comes to certain parts of the population, which traditionally are being more targeted by law enforcement. So because of that, some, some states, some cities uh, decided to ban the use of the, te of the technology, of Clearview, Clearview AI technology. So for example, in New York State, in, in New Jersey, a day after the report um, of uh, the reporting of the New York Times was published, uh, they, the governor of New Jersey said, I. I ordered uh, to stop using this technology. So I, I don't want to say that Clearview AI technology is in use because at this point, you know, it became the hot potato that no one wants to touch, but there are other technologies and the answer is yes. And moreover, Larry, I can tell you and the rest of the audience, there is a website called PMIS, PMPIM and then Eyes. Uh, that all of us can upload pictures of whoever we want, and that this website will find pictures that are publicly available online about this person. And through the picture, we can find information about them because it can be from an article about them. It can be from their high school. It can be so. And and this is you know it touches um, on the heart of the problem is here, which is we all share information publicly. And it seems innocuous. It seems like it's it's okay to have a picture of us on a, I don't know, on a school article uh, that we published when we were in high school. But at the end of the day, because of the way the information ecosystem works today, this information is later can be repackaged and used to identify us or to somehow build a profile about us. So you'll see, after you and I talked weeks ago, um, I gave that uh, website to my grandson, who's 19 years old, and he looked up his own picture and he found all kinds of pictures of people doing very nefarious things, porn things that weren't him. Right. Which is another problem. Right. And I think I told you, I have a friend 
When I found out about PMIs, and I mean, I have the privilege and maybe not the privilege of knowing about these things fairly early on because I'm part of the community that researches that. So I found, found when I found out first about PMIs, I was mind blown because, you know, Clearview AI was a product that is only sold to com big commercial entities or police departments, but PMIs, like each and every one of us can just go and put pictures on. And the problem was that sometimes it was very accurate, but sometimes it 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 uh, pulled up pictures of people from porn websites and other explicit pictures, and uh, many people who just you know don't want this information associated with them anymore. Um, but even pictures that are not of them. And I, when I first discovered about that, I remember I was going out with my girlfriends, and I I told my friend, let's try it, and I put her picture. And then there was a picture from a porn site and I'm very close friends with her. And I, it was hard for me to tell that it wasn't her. So the problem is also with that, you know, this picture exists of someone else out there that looks really very much like you. And now you have to defend yourself somehow because it can still be used against you, right? It, it, it's, I find it shocking, but let me ask you another question. The constitution, the fourth amendment of the constitution is supposed to protect us against unreasonable search and seizure. Does the Fourth Amendment come into play when it comes to any of this, these things that we're talking about, including facial recognition? So Larry, I think the key word here is unreasonable, right? What is unreasonable? And I mean, there was a poor, a, 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 Peer research study uh, um, last month about facial recognition. More than half of the American survey thought that the use of facial recognition for law enforcement purposes is positive. Like yeah, we they, want have, to they haven't talked to you. <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm saying it's it's completely wrong. I'm just saying any kind of powerful technology that is used without checks and balances is wrong, period. We need to have checks and balances. We need to have these conversations so people understand what the risks are. I'm not saying don't have TikTok on your phone. Have it on your phone. Just understand what you're giving away. I'm not saying don't give law enforcement the power to use facial recognition. I'm just saying don't do it in a wild, wild west manner. Put in some well, checks and balances. Make sure to account for error. Okay. And, and who, so, should, who should do that? Should that be the federal government or state governments? Both but federal for sure. The fact that we still don't have any federal law is really disgraceful. In this sure. country, in 2000, uh, 2013, uh, 2023, sorry, we still don't have a privacy law. To me, that's insane. Do other countries have privacy laws? Yes, of course. So the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, which thankfully has some spillovers in the United States as well. Um, I mean, I mean, it's not a perfect law. I'm, I'm one of the critiques of that choice of regulation, but at least there is something that addresses all sectors. In the United States, privacy regulation is sectoral. So we have um, we have financial privacy laws, we have medical privacy laws, we have a privacy law that is said to protect children, but it doesn't. Uh, but it, at least it's on the books. Um, we don't have any privacy law that protects us across the board. No. There is one in Europe. There are many other countries that follow suit, um, including you know countries in Africa and um, and other states. But here in the United States, as I said, since 2018, there have been multiple attempts, but not yet. According to a recent Supreme Court decision, your telephone can't be used without a warrant to track your location. But it seems to me facial recognition, if it's done frequently enough, as you point out, in the stores, in the retail, in the subways, in the uh, bus terminals, you're tracking me yes. using facial recognition. Why isn't that contrary to, to law? 100%. And, and again, the answer is, again, this race that we mentioned before between technology and the law. You need to always remember the law is always catching up. Technology moves ahead. If you guys remember, the motto for Facebook was move fast and break things. And this is, I think this is the theme for all startups. And we, to some extent, it's it's good because this is disruption and this is what we're looking for in innovative environments. But on other senses, it's not good because the law takes time to catch up. Again, just think about what's happening with privacy. 
we all care about our privacy, yet we're looking at five years of attempts on the federal level to pass any kind of omnibus legislation about privacy without success. And, and it's a bipartisan issue, right? So I- but who's opposed to it? So who, I can tell you about- the opposition? The, the opposition has to do with, um, so two things. One is very specific provisions about, for example, should there be a, a private right of action? Should we allow individuals to sue in case there is a violation of privacy under the law? Companies do not want that, and there is a very strong lobby against it. Another um, another point that has been debated greatly is preemption. So if you guys are familiar with preemption, it means that usually federal laws preempt state laws. So if there is a state law that provides privacy protections, the federal law, if it also provides privacy, privacy protections and there is some kind of conflict between the two, will go with the federal standard. And for example, that was the reason why the, the recent attempt failed, because under the ADPPA, the protection of privacy was um, by far better than what we have now for most American states, but less than what, for example, California residents get under the, their state law. And Nancy Pelosi, which was the speaker of the, of the House at that time, um, she said, I'm not taking down to I'm, I'm not taking this law to a floor vote because I will not be able to come to California residents and tell them that I contributed to lowering the standard of privacy protection for them. So there are different reasons why we don't see that moving forward. But I think the most um, the most important are these two preemption and private right of action. Once we figure that part out, we'll be able to have the law because the rest is pretty, pretty settled. So I want to take you now to something you mentioned earlier in our conversation. That's what's going on with Madison Square Garden and the Dolans and the Radio City Music Hall. Um, Madison Square Garden owned by the Dolans. The Dolans had a problem. Mm -hmm. Law firms are suing the Dolans. And the Dolans have said, in effect, uh, while these suits are going on, you, the law firms, and there's 90 law firms involved, and all your lawyers, which must mean thousands of lawyers, cannot enter Madison Square Garden, we will not sell you a ticket and you can't come into Madison Square Garden. Yes. Where does that fit under your legal risks or fear of facial recognition? And it's being, the way they're identifying these folks is by facial recognition. They have uh, faces of all the lawyers at all the law firms and you come to the um, ticket vendor and hand in your ticket, it recognizes your face, you're told to go to security. So we have to understand that in terms of legal protections, if they were using facial recognition to deny entrance of people from certain protected categories and groups, such as based on gender or race or national origin, they wouldn't be able to do that. The problem with this case is that they didn't refer to any protected categories. They were just preventing certain people uh, with whom they were involved in litigation from entering their facilities. So in terms of the law, they are in the clear. The problem is that we, all, and I mean, I think we all would feel differently if they were just using picture, like using people looking at pictures and saying, oh, this person is trying to walk in. She looks like a lawyer that I have here on the list. Let me just make sure it's her. We would all feel differently about it, but there is something about using this automated system on scale and preventing people from entering what we deem to be almost a public um, facility, like public sector facility, but it's not. We need to remember it's a private sector actor. They have the right to do that. And at the end of the day, I think specifically for this story, it's not the use of facial recognition that troubles us. It's maybe the power that is granted to those commercial actors. Um, because again, I always ask myself when I hear these kind of stories, what bothers me there? And if there was a person conducting this kind of um, entrance verification, would we feel differently about it? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure we wouldn't. I'm sure, I, I, I actually think that we, uh, would feel okay with that. And what we care about is more the, the use of this technology on large scale and also the potential for errors that we all know is there and is targeting specifically vulnerable populations. So this is yeah. my two cents, but from a legal perspective, what they did is perfectly legal. Go ahead, Bikita. 
But say, so Yafit, speaking of large scale, these technologies are also used for convenience. I think about being able to get into um, the Mets arena because Clear allows me, a member, to scan my face or eyes or into the airport, for example. So there are large scale uses that are also supporting convenience for people who choose to voluntarily participate. So we haven't so much talked about that part of it at all of it. Yes. 100%. And Pekita, I am an information addict. Like if you looked at my phone, I, I think I have most apps out there. I really enjoy like social networks and I enjoy different services and products that are offered. Um, I, as a privacy scholar, I know a lot about the problems, but I acknowledge the fact that for my convenience, sometimes I will choose to use a specific service. Some services I will not use, but some specific services, I acknowledge the trade-off that I participate in. Definitely 100%. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. I was at a conference a few months ago. It was using facial recognition and I had the ability to opt out, but to opt out, I had to fill in forms and I had to submit them and I had to wait for three days. And then when I walked in, I had to go to a spe special line and I had to go through a human to identify me with an ID. And I was like, okay, I don't want this headache. I'm just taking the facial recognition route. So I think you're absolutely right. And this is something that I really want to highlight in this conversation. We're talking about many risks, many issues, many problems, but we all need to remember the reason this technology is so successful, the reason it's so prominent, the reason it's um it's everywhere is because it's convenient. It's because it's easier. And this is why we all want to use it. And this is why we all give away information. I mean, we all have smartphones. Do you know how much information is collected on your phone? Everything, right? But we do that because we participate in this you know, data system, data ecosystem where information is collected, but we're getting a lot in return. And this is why my take would be, we need to work more on the regulation to make sure that there are checks and balances around the technology and the use of the technology. But I'm not by any means saying, you know, kill this technology. No, we're all enjoying it. We're all using it, but we just need to be aware and informed of the risks so that our elected representatives do their job and pass legislations to make sure checks and balances are in place. But, but you know, see, going back to Madison Square Garden for a second, so they are, are, let me use the word, discriminating against the lawyers that are bringing actions against them or the law firms bringing actions against them. What if they wanted to bring the same um, ban, not based on race or gender or anything like that, to another group of people, uh, vendors that they're unhappy with, and nobody at those vendors, the people that supply uh, hot dogs and popcorn and all the rest, could they do that? So again, Larry, this is a different area of the law that I don't feel as comfortable speaking about because I'm not an expert in, but I mean, this is this has nothing to do with the use of facial recognition. And this is why I told you before, I think what we're troubled by is the perhaps abuse of power in this case, and not so much the use of facial recognition. Well, isn't this power centralized in very few places? Government, of course, has yes. enormous power in this area. And I'm, I'm, when I say the word government, I include police departments that are local uh, within government. Do I want that much concentration of power in a few places? That's a great question to ask. And especially when this power is combined with powerful technologies, I, I couldn't agree more. Does it scare you? I mean, to scare me, you need more than that, but I'm very hopeful because my, from what I'm seeing in, in my position, which is, as I said, tech policy is forward looking. We see many of the risks that many of the things that I'm working on right now in my research are things that we're going to talk about in this webinar in five years from now. So facial recognition I was working on, I was writing about like back in 2015, 2016. So what, what I see today is that there are many issues, there are many concerns, especially around concentration of power and the potential for abuse when powerful technologies are involved. But at the same time, what I see is that the public is much more informed today. 
Um, we know more about those risks. We know more about the problems and we, and this is why we demand action and we see action, right? We see action on the city level. We see action on the state level. And hopefully within the coming years, we're going to see more action on the federal level as well. So no, I'm not scared. I'm very optimistic. And yet the amount of action is minimal. I mean, New York City has a law that says you have to disclose if you're using this technology. But the rest of the state doesn't have it. The rest of the state has different laws. So, for example, the rest of the state passed um, a, a law that prohibits the use of facial recognition in schools. So what I'm saying is, of course, yeah, I mean, legislation is, is slow everywhere. But I feel like there is much more awareness today. And I feel like even when you look at the incentive systems within businesses, they are better aware. Some of them are just, you know, ethically conscious, but some of them are also thinking practically, like, I don't want to be part of any sensation that involves the, you know, violation of privacy. So I'm going to be more careful with the collection of information and the use of information. This is, again, from my perspective, and I understand that people are um, concerned, of course, we should be concerned, but the fact that we are concerned is good because five years ago, those problems were here, but we weren't concerned because we didn't know about them. So I think we're, we're getting there. So presumably the prohibition against the use of facial recognition in schools relates to the fact that we are minors primarily in schools. So is there some other law or regulation that would protect minors from some of the things that we're talking about that are more publicly, yet yeah, more about public use of their images? And so the public use is different because we have a privacy law that's called COPA, uh, Children Online Privacy Protection Law, and that's a federal law. So back in the 90s, there was this understanding that we have to start thinking about privacy, 90s of the previous century. Um, and, um, you know, the FTC stepped in and the one of the first laws that they were thinking about back then were to protect children. Uh, now, I, I should say that this law is not good law. It's not protecting children as it should. It's at this point, because it was enacted back in the 90s, it's outdated. But at the same time, it's still there. It's still on the books. And what it says is that if there is any service or product that is directed at children, there are specific protections that include the need to get consent from the parents whenever information is being collected. Now, bear in mind, everybody, if you go to Disney, uh, to Disney parks, they do use facial recognition. It's part of the way the they kind of regulate um, traffic in the park. So you have to scan your face when you enter the park. Of course, you have the option of opting out, but like, what, what are you gonna do? Not go to the park? Like you booked flight, hotels, whatever. Like, yeah, now I'm not gonna use facial recognition. I'm not going into Disney. So for example, with Disney, which is of course a product that is targeted at children, if we look at COPA, when they scan children's faces, they do have to meet certain requirements, including security standards and including getting, um, getting consent from the parents. But bear in mind, one, it's only for children under the age of 13, and two, consent is broken, and I'm happy to talk about it in a different webinar, but consent is not it's not a really useful tool. So, you know, parents will say yes for the reasons I just mentioned. You got to Disney Park. You're not going to just back up and so go. Is the consent buried in the small print of your ticket somewhere? Um, I think you, I, I don't, I, I was not there when they started using it. So, but from what I heard from friends, you have to check a box when you buy the ticket. And also when you come to the park, they also scan your finger. Um, so you also have to provide affirmative consent. Gwen, before I turn it over to you, one more question. Yafit, is there technology now that links facial recognition with names? So not of only do they see, and so they know my name. They know this face is my name. Clearview AI does that. Clearview AI that I mentioned before that is that was used extensively by police departments. Um, and I, I don't know which technologies they're using today, but I'm sure Clearview AI has other competitors that uh, are in use, but didn't get as bad press as Clearview AI. And also, as I mentioned before, PMIs. So if your grandson put his picture 
Um, and then he found even one picture of himself on PMIs. All a person who was looking for them had to do was to click on that picture. And then you go to a website and usually there is some identifying information about the person in the picture. So, so either so it's I'm, directly, sorry. So everybody, since everybody is being uh, um, walking around and uh, th there are probably multiple images of me every day, maybe hundreds of images of me every day, everybody is being tracked everywhere. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Oh, I'm glad I'm not young. Gwen. <laughs> Thank you, Ollie. Uh, as usual, we hate to interrupt the conversation. Uh, there, there have been quite a few questions, and we have time for just a few, but I'll pick the ones for which there seem to be several uh, questioners. Um, one thing you said, uh, Yafi, is that Black women are most vulnerable from the inaccuracy of the facial recognition technologies uh, due to inadequate representation in the database. Does a similar problem exist for Asian women? Um, the answer is yes. A similar problem exists for any kind of minority, um, so Asian women included. But in terms of the statistic uh, inaccuracy or the potential for statistical inaccuracy, the highest level are Black women. But and yes, will, the answer is yes. Will that change when the database grows? I mean, that's that's the hope that it will change as the database grows. And I know that there have been multiple occasions at which, for example, Google was found to have, a, I mean, we also call it biased um, search engine for pictures when it came to, um, to black people generally. And they were trying to de-bias the algorithm. Uh, so kind of, to, to put it in simpler words, they were trying to make up for the misrepresentation in the da database through some kind of twinking, uh, tweaking the algorithm. Um, and it hasn't been successful for several years. They were trying, and at some point they just gave up and just took some options for search out of the search engine because the results were always biased and errors. All right, uh, here's another one for you, Yuffie. Can you comment on China's large active facial recognition database for police and political uses and reasons? Sure. So, I mean, it's it's the big elephant in the room, right? In China, there is a social credit system that is uh, being rolled out. Um, I, I must say, though, that um, Western media was not doing justice when reporting about the social credit system. And I'm saying that as, as someone who was actively researching that. Um, so we know that the picture is slightly different, but in terms of facial recognition and the use of facial recognition, the reporting was 100% accurate. Facial recognition is everywhere. Um, if you walk, for example, if you jaywalk in China, um, you will be identified through a facial recognition system and there is an active shaming system. So your picture will be broadcasted um, on different billboards across the city with your name and identifying information and the fact that you were jaywalking or you were cutting a red light or whatever it is that you were doing. So yes, I mean, this is what China is doing and we are, we are concerned about that in the West for two reasons. One, um, we don't wanna get there for ethical reasons, right? And, and we have different democratic standards that we pursue. Um, but the, the second reason, which we didn't have time to go into, but I'm just going to mention it here for you guys, you can always Google it and look, look for information about it, is the arms race. So we're really concerned about the arms race with China and Russia and other, uh, other non-democratic countries that don't have the same ethical checks and balances that we place or want to place on various technologies, including facial recognition. And the problem is, and the question which I, th I think is a fair question, to what extent we we want to give them the lead when it comes to these powerful technologies. To like, I just read last week that the U.S. Um, Navy is using facial recognition. They just entered into a huge contract for facial recognition technologies in drones. So we're going to have drones now that are able to identify a person and theoretically kill them or whatever use of warfare that you can think of. So I mean. Do we want not to have this technology in America and we want to leave it to countries like Russia and China? This is a real question that we need to think about. So thanks for asking this question because it gave me an opportunity to bring this very important topic. 
Thank you, Yafi. This is a question for Paquita. How do you see facial rec recognition technology being used by universities? Are there any potential uses that will be quite different in education than business or government? Uh, can it be used for more than controlling access to classroom buildings and student dorms? Um, for example, could it be used to monitor or discourage free speech? Well, um, I, I'm not the technologist. I'm an accountant in financial reporting, but clearly in higher education, um, there is a concern recently about um, how we communicate and then identifying people who maybe communicate views that are different than um, those uh, valued by the university is one potential use. But I would say trying to err on the side of being a little more positive. Um, we could certainly continue to look at options for things like academic integrity, right? We um, have more opportunities for students to take exams and to, to do presentations and things that are in an online or virtual environment. So just making sure that the person who who is sitting for the CPA exam or sitting for the accounting final exam is the person that we you know registered for the course. And as we launch more online MBA and graduate programs and opportunities for, for those to be, again, virtually removed, facial recognition technology could be very useful to make sure that we're granting a degree to the person who's enrolled. And then we also have academic research where people use eye tracking technology to try to gain an idea about thoughts or, or reactions to products. And so facial recognition might be another way to enhance the ability for academic research to give us information about reactions to different products, for example. Well, thank you. Maybe another webinar on that topic. Um, Larry, we, we are very close to the end now, but I have one final question for you. Following this discussion with Yafit and Takeda on risks and benefits of this technology, do you have a sense for whether on balance its uses in the future will be for good or for evil? I must admit I come down on the for evil side because I am, maybe because I'm old, I'm not willing to trade convenience for concentration of power, especially in government. Um, I, I don't like all this concentration of power. I'm willing to give up and sacrifice some convenience uh, to lessen the concentration of power. I can't help thinking of what the Holocaust did. And can you imagine facial recognition in the Holocaust? Uh, they would have gotten everybody. And I'm sure right now, uh, the Uyghurs don't like um, uh, facial recognition uh, in terms of their minority status in China. Uh, I'm frightened of this. I guess I I'll have to get accustomed to it because the world is going where the world is going. Larry, I think that is the last word for the moment. Um, I wanna thank you, Larry. Thank you, Yafit. Thank you, Fakita, for a really, really engaging discussion. Um, we will be announcing our next webinar soon. As always, it will be on the second Tuesday of each month. So it will be April 11th. Um, when we, we will announce it soon, it will be by email and by uh, on the website. Again, thank you, Yafit, Fakita, and Larry. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody.